So this form up here, uh, like I said, word for word is going to be on your test, um, except for the word variance, cross that out. But I, I basically just want you to be able to, to create a box and whisker plot um, and do this in the calculator, okay? Because the calculator will show those outliers. I do not teach the formula on how to find the outliers by hand because I rely on the calculator for that, okay? Also, the calculator finds the standard deviation for us. Again, I don't uh, teach you how to do that by hand. The formula is ridiculous. Um, I just let the calculator do that, okay? The calculator will also tell us the mean uh, and will give us enough information to find the range in the IQR, okay? So look back over your notes from yesterday and look at those. Uh, the blue notes told you how to do it and the box of wish plot, the red notes told you how to find all these words here and then we'll, we'll reconvene. All right, so out of some time, um, we went through the notes, we went through the calculator and we created our box of wish plot. Uh, first thing we did was found all this information over here to the right using our one variable stats menu. Okay, one variable stats. Uh, let's write down everything. So we figured out mean from that, right? What was that? I already forgot. What was the mean? 20.2. And again, in that screen, it's your X bar. Okay, it's the one that has the uh, minus at it. What was the standard deviation? The SX. 11. 4.39. So we got those two things. Um, the menu itself doesn't tell us the range of the IQR, but we got the information for it, right? We got our five number summary. The min, the Q1, um, the median, the Q3, and the max. What was the min? Or what was the max was 45, right? Yeah. What was Q1? 13. What was the median? And was it 25 here? Yeah. Cool. So again, if you scroll down on one variable stats, you'll find those five numbers. And we can use those five numbers to find our range and our IQR. Mm -hmm. What's our range? How do we find range? Max. Max minus min, right? So here's our maximum value. Here's our minimum value. We take those two and subtract, right? 45 minus 4. 40. What about IQR? What does that stand for? Quartile range, how do we find that? Yeah. Q3 minus Q1, or 25 minus 13. It's the inner range. So you just kind of bring your scope in a little bit. 25 minus 13, which is 12. Alright, so uh, any questions there? So we got all this information. Let's do a box and whisker plot. Um, Again, use your calculators because that 45 ends up being an outlier. Okay? But just plot all your uh, five number summaries. So you want to plot the 4, then the 13, then the 20, then the 25. I'm going to stop there uh, because that's, that's my box that goes to my whisker. But this whisker right here on the right doesn't go all the way to 45. And since it's an outlier, it goes to the next highest number, which was. 28, thank you. Yeah, some questions on that? Feel good about that? Record. Uh, all right, so today's lesson um, is the second part of statistics. Okay, so yesterday we talked about all the different ways that we could describe data, right? There's three ways, shape, center, and spread. Um, we ended the class yesterday with spread, we did range and IQR, and we touched on the third way, which was standard deviation, but I didn't give a definition. Today's notes are all about standard deviation and what we can do with that. It's going to lead to something called normal distribution curve and the empirical curve, which if you took that three a couple years ago, you probably would say four. Okay? So, take a second, write down this definition for standard deviation, um, and we'll talk about two applications that we can do with it. Okay, so this is kind of my little definition for it. I don't want to get too fancy with it. But it's a set number that you find in a data set. So whatever our data is that we're looking at, it's going to change what our standard deviation is. It's specific to the problem. And in a way, it describes how the values differ from the mean. Okay, so uh, the bigger the standard deviation, 
basically, the more spread out our numbers are from the mean. So the smaller the standard deviation, the closer our data is around our mean. Okay. Uh, another way to think about it, so like if I have a big standard deviation, it means that my numbers are spread out and they are less consistent. Okay, so the closer they are together, the more consistent they are with each other. Try to keep that in mind because that's going to be a question later. Okay. Um, any questions about that? There's a whole big fancy formula that I'll let AP stats talk about with you, but for now, we're just going to talk about what it does. Okay. Any questions on that? All right. So uh, we use standard deviation to find something called a z-score, okay? And z-score is pretty cool because it helps you compare two items that normally we couldn't compare. Uh, the best example I can come up with is SAT scores versus ACT scores. Okay, so let's think about it. I mean, if I take the SAT, I don't even know what's out these days. It's 1600. When I was in school, I think it was like 24 or something. Like, it's 1600 now, right? And the ACT is out of what, 326? So like if I say I got like a 28 on the ACT and a 1300 on the SAT, like I don't know, I don't know who did better. Like I could probably have an idea if you took both, but like those scores don't compare to each other. So the good thing is, is that a Z score can help bring those two scores down to a level that we can actually compare. Um, and I think that's a really good example. They do it with, with like heights. Um, like between males and females, like usually males are taller than females, but they can take the z-scores of each age group and determine who is taller relative to the age. And they can do that with any set of data, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so basically what a z-score is in comparison to a standard deviation is it, it tells us how many standard deviations we are from the and later on in the class, we're going to connect this to a normal distribution curve, and we're going to talk about how, like, in a perfect world, in the normal distribution, uh, what the percent breakdown is of standard deviations away from the mean arc. Okay? But for now, I need you to understand that a z-score is the value that we have in a data set, subtract the mean, divided by the standard deviation. That'll tell us how many z-scores, how many standard deviations we are away from that value. All right? So any questions on this? Let's look at an example. Now, <laughs> this example, let me just preface it. Uh, I realized uh, before we read it that a two year old girl and an eight year old girl are the same heights, like, or, or not going to be the same heights. Like, <laughs> I get that, okay? So just keep that in mind. Don't make fun of the question as we go through it, all right? It says if the mean height of a uh, two year old girl is 34 inches with a standard deviation of 1.6 inches, and the mean height of an eight-year-old girl is 50 inches with a standard deviation of 1.8 inches. Who is taller? A two-year-old girl that is 30 inches or an eight-year-old girl that is 46 inches? Okay, I get it. Obviously, the eight-year-old girl is taller, but what this question is missing is relative to their age. Okay, who's taller relative to their age? Right? It's, it's, it's taking two separate categories and comparing it using these words. Is that Kind of make sense a little bit. I know it seems silly. This might have been the best problem to start off with, but let's just go with it. Okay. Let's go with a two year old first. <laughs> Maybe I should have done one with SAT and ACT first. Two year old and eight year old. All right, let's find the two-year-old's z-score first. So, uh, what is the two-year-old's value? How tall is the two-year-old? Three, four inches? Okay. What's the uh, the mean height? The girl is the mean Oh, crap, you're right. My bad video, people. The height of the two-year-old that we're looking at is 30 inches, and the mean height is 34. I apologize. Good catch. The formula says take the value, subtract the mean, and divide by the standard deviations, which in this case was 1.6. And you can already tell by looking at these numbers here, this 30 minus 34, her value is well below the mean. She's four inches below the mean height for her age group. 
Okay, and it turns out that whenever your mean or whatever your value is below the mean, you're going to have a negative z-score. That negative means that you are below the mean. We'll say that being like negative two something, negative two point five. So I'm saying that her z-score, she is negative 2.5 standard deviations below the mean. We'll see later in the class, that's kind of like not good. <laughs> uh, you don't see many people pass two standard deviations away from the mean. Okay? So in this case, she is really short for her age. Uh, what about the eight-year-old? She is, what, 46 inches? And then their mean is 50. Now, again, I mean, she's below the mean. She's four inches below the mean. But her standard deviation is only is, is 1.8. So there's a little bit more of a spread between the values. What's that in the mean? Negative something? 2.2? Sure. Okay, so it turns out even in this problem, who ends up being taller relative to their age? The eight-year-old. She's got a bigger z-score. She's higher up on the scale. In comparison between the age groups, yes, she is taller. Okay? That's what a z-score does. It takes all this data, brings it down to a uh, comparable level based off of everybody in the population. That's kind of what it does. Okay. Any questions on that? This one's a little bit better. This one kind of goes more along the lines of the SAT and the ACT thing I was talking about. It says, suppose a student takes two exams, getting 55 on a biology test and a 60 on an anatomy test. I don't know what scale they're both great out of. I mean, it could be both out of 100. It couldn't be. I don't know which one was harder, which one had more questions. You can't compare the two grades together to get them in two separate groups, two separate tests. What you can do is use the information of what everybody got to compute their z-score and then compare. Okay? Now, this question is pretty much a very similar to one test. So maybe start on that one for going back to study later. But. It says the class uh, scores for each exam are normally distributed, which means we can use our z-score. And it says for the biology test, the mean is 50, standard deviation is 5. For the anatomy test, the mean is 50 as well, but the standard deviation is 12. On which test do you do that? So we need to find the z-score for the biology test and the anatomy test. How do I, uh, what's the, what's the setup for the biology? What did she score? 55 minus 50 over 5. Right. So she's above the mean, which means that her uh, standard deviation is going to, or her z-score is going to be positive. So five, 55 minus 50 is 5, divided by 5 is 1. She is one standard deviation above the mean, which is actually pretty good. So relative to everybody, she scored really well in this, uh, this test. What about the anatomy one? So she scored a 60? The mean was, now she scored 10 points above the mean, so that's pretty good. But the standard deviation is 12, so there was more spread out numbers um, in this case. So it might not be quite as high. What is it? 0.3. Oh, 0.83, sorry. So technically, which one did she score better on? Biology. Biology one is higher, higher standard deviation, higher on the scale. She's better. Uh, being higher isn't always the best thing. Uh, like, like maybe if I'm talking about like cholesterol level or something, maybe you want to be in the, the lower percentile instead of the higher one there, right? So, uh, but for the most part, usually it is better. Be Questions on this? Last one with this, and we'll jump into the new stuff, and it won't take too long. Okay. Um, this is a sample of 34 focuses. Uh, have a mean MPG of 25.8 with a standard deviation of 1.3 MPG. A sample of Tundras have a mean of 19.6 and a standard deviation of 1.8. So, so from here to here, that's just telling you the mean standard deviation. Okay, that's all that information is on. But it says that I got this one chick who has a focus, and she gets a value of 27 MPGs. And I want to know what Billy's Tundra is going to have to have to be considered better. So what's my thought process? How would I, how would I approach this one? Uh, 
Let's do the focus. Sure. Let's figure out the z-score of the focus. 27 is the value. And then what was the uh, mean? 25.8. So just judging off of that, she is above the mean. So that's pretty good. She's doing pretty good for her focus. Uh, but the standard deviation was 1.3. What's that end up being? 8.9 something. 923. All right, cool. So, uh, so Susan's got a she's point nine two three above the standard deviation. It's positive. It's above the, the mean, uh, which means she's doing all right. It's good. But uh, how do I figure out how Billy's tundra to be considered better than that? What do I do? Solve for x. Solve for x for the tundra. All right. I want to know this value over here. So I want to set that equal to x, right? X minus, what was the mean for the tundra? What was the standard deviation? All right, but what am I going to set that equal to? i got to have it set equal to something to solve for X. Yeah, 0.923. I'm trying to figure out what value is going to be better than 0.923. So, so let's find that value and it's got to be greater than that, I guess. Okay. So, hey, this is like what the first time we've done um, <laughs> a freaking algebra problem the whole year. So, what do I do? How do I solve this? Yeah. That's ugly looking. That's just, that says times 0.18, I promise. So, what is, uh, so we have x minus 19.6 equals, what's point nine? Two, three times. Uh, one point eight. Point two something. Yeah. Point point one something. Point something. I like it. All right. And then add nineteen point six to both sides. What does that mean? Like twenty one point something. So that's what I get for x, and if, if that's his value for the tundra, then they end up having the same z-score. I want to know what, what's better, so maybe it's safe to say when x is greater than 21.26. Right? If you said equal to, I would get it wrong. I'm just, I mean, technically, I guess it's better to say greater than. But that was just in the case of working backwards. So sometimes I'll give you the z-score, sometimes I'll give you the value. Just kind of Question on Z-score, I think it's pretty cool. It works. All right. Um, let's keep on this. <laughs> okay. So we're about to learn normal distribution curve. Looks like that. Paranormal. Get it? Okay. Move on. We'll stop. All right. Um, so what does Z-score is helpful for, too, is it, is it can be read on the normal distribution curve. Um, I've been talking about this the last couple of days. I haven't really given a good definition for it yet, but... A normal distribution curve is a symmetrical, so we know what that means, and it's a bell curve looking thing um, that follows something called the empirical rule, which is kind of what we're learning today. Okay? The empirical rule is the percent, uh, percentage that tells us how our standard deviation is different from the mean. Okay? So, let's look at an example. Let's break it down. This is a normal distribution curve. If you notice, it looks very similar to that histogram we talked about yesterday that was symmetric. You know how I kind of shaped it out with the curve itself? Because technically, that's that's kind of what's going on right here. This is a number line. Okay, it could represent any any type of numbers in the data or whatever. And right here in the middle, this is kind of like like the, the peak of my histogram. This is saying where a majority of my data is at. So you kind of see here in the middle, the curve is at its highest point. That means we got like a, a big bar here, I guess. This value in the middle is my mean. If I have a normal distribution of data, the mean is always in the middle. That's where a majority of my data is centered around. And as I go away from the mean in either direction, in a positive or negative way, uh, it gets smaller and smaller data. There. Okay? And less and less of my data is going to be far away from my mean, which makes sense because the mean is the average. Um, but with a normally distributed curve, there, there is a, an approximate percentage of how these, uh, these, these data points differ from the mean. And it says that approximately 
percent of data is going to fall within one standard deviation of the mean, which is what these hash marks represent. So I'm saying between these two points, um, plus one standard deviation and minus one standard deviation, I'm saying that we have 68% of my data. 68%. Over half of my population falls within one standard deviation. Then approximately 95%, all but 5% of my data is going to be within two standard deviations of the mean. Which I think is awesome. That's two standard deviations. So between minus two and plus two standard deviations from the mean, we have approximately 95% of my data. And then lastly, approximately 99.7, all but 0.3% of my data are going to be within three standard deviations of the mean. So if you're in a data set and your value is past three to the right or to the left, you are in a very, very small minority. Okay, not many people or not much data goes past that. So from here to here is 99.7%. Right? <clears throat> okay, um, oh, I write that. Minus three and plus three. Okay, now it's not just, I mean, so those are the three numbers that I remember. That's the empirical rule, but we can kind of break that up. Let's think about this. If this is my mean right here in the middle and it's a symmetric curve, What's the percent of values that are fall to the right of the mean? Half. 50%. 50%, right? 50% here and 50% here. That's just because it's symmetric. Mm -hmm. So let's think about this. If 68% if falls within one to the left and one to the right, how many falls between uh, just one to the left of the mean? This area right here. Yeah, 34%. And 34%. Right, just divided by two. It's symmetric. Uh, what about like say like this region right here between two and one below the standard deviation? How do I figure that out? Let's think about this. How do I figure out these two regions here? Yep. So you're going to take the 95%, the total, subtract the middle part, 68%, and you're left with 27% and you divide by two. So 13.5. And by the same math, I can take 99.7%, subtract 95%, and then divide by 2. I believe that's 2.35% and 2.35%. And then lastly, what if I wanted to know, like, just 3 to the right of the standard deviation, like, like 3 past the median? I can just do 100 minus 99.7, which is just 0.3. Divide that by two. So, so 0.15% of my data is to the right of three standard deviations. And 0.15% is to the left. On your test, I'm going to tell you, like, I'm giving you a blank one of these, and I'm asking you to fill out all of these percents. Personally, I just remember these three numbers and do the math, but if you want to memorize all of these, go for it. Okay. Normal distribution curve. Let's... Let's give an example to kind of make this make a little bit of sense. I think I think it's a pretty good example. We uh, well, a couple years ago when I was teaching this for the first time, uh, we looked up the mean height for adult males in America. Yeah, in America, and it was like five foot ten point something. So we rounded it. It was like so we're gonna say like the mean height is gonna be five foot 11 inches. I think that's pretty fair. On average, adult males in America, it's about 5 foot 11. Okay. And we kind of determined the standard deviation was like actually like 2 point something, but I think we rounded it to just an even 3 inches. That's how they differ from the mean. So let's think about this. 5 foot 11, 
and then one standard deviation to the left and right. That's just adding and subtracting three inches. So it's five foot eleven plus three is six foot two, and five foot eight. So I'm saying that approximately sixty-eight percent of my population falls between five foot eight and six foot two. Can you kind of get behind that? That, that makes sense. Sure. I mean, I'm I'm six foot one, so I'm, I mean, I'm in the. Okay. Uh, let's add and subtract three more. So six foot five and five foot five. So 95% of my population falls between 5 foot 5 and 6 foot 5. Right? Can you, maybe? I can see that. I don't know many people past 6 foot 5. But here's the best one. I mean, so if I add three more inches, that's 6 foot 8 and 5 foot 2. I don't know many guys, many adult males that are shorter than 5 foot 2. And I really don't know that many that are taller than 6 foot 8. So almost 100%. Fall within that. I mean, unless you go like to like an NBA game or something, or I don't know the reverse of an NBA game would be to be fair. A derby. I don't I didn't really hear what you said. I just heard it. Oh God. God. <laughs> Edit that out of the video. Right. That would be it. Uh, but I think that makes sense. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's do one more example. Hey, okay, this is a short lesson. Let's do one more example, and then we'll be done. Question to do just like this on the test, right? So I, I'm going to expect you to be able to fill out a normal distribution curve and answer some questions, okay? So it says that we got 2,000 freshmen at State University, whatever, they took a biology test. Um, the scores are normally distributed. We got a mean of 75, a standard deviation of 5. So that's good to know. Um, label the mean and three standard deviations from the mean on the curve, and then answer the questions. So, when you're filling out a curve, I would start with the mean in the center on my number now. If I want to know three standard deviations to the right and left, just add, right? 75 and 5 is 80, 85, and 90. So, not many people scored past 90, almost none. And I know 2,000 seems like a pretty big number, but that's a pretty small size. So, the smaller your data is, the less likely it'll be past two or three standard deviations for me. Because you got to find like a rare case of people to get past that. Okay. Uh, you don't have to, but I think it might be helpful to maybe Go ahead and put those percentages, just to kind of keep those in mind um, as we do this problem. 2.35, 2 2.35, 2 2 2 2 Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, let's see. It says what percent of scores are between 70 and 80? So here's 70. Here's 80. That's one standard deviation from the mean. What is that? Here's the 80. All right, what about this next one? Uh, what percent of scores are between 65 and 75? So, what percent of two standard deviations below the mean, I guess? Yeah, whatever, 13.5 and 34 is uh, 47.5. Uh, what percentage of scores are between 65 again and now 90? So that's all the way over there. So it's going to be a pretty big chunk. You can add those up or however way you want, really. And isn't that just 95% plus 2.35%? 97.5%. Plus All right, what about less than a score of 60? What are some of that? At 0.15, right? Yeah. Uh, 
Um, what percentage of scores is greater than 85? So here's 85. Greater than would be to the right, right? So 2.5, right? Everything to the right would be these two numbers. So 2.5%. Alright, but what about F and G? It says approximately how many biology students scored between 65 and 75. How would I do that? Yeah, I got the percentage. I found the percentage of this in uh, letter B. It was 47.5%, but it wants to know how many. Okay, so take your total number of students, 2,000, and find that percentage. Which I think is like nine something. Nine fifty. And she's the same question. It says approximately how many biology students scored between sixty and sixty-five? So between sixty and sixty-five is that percentage. So whatever two thousand times point two three five is. Four seventy? Oh, two, three, five, four, six. Oh, 47. Dang. Yeah, it is point oh two three five. Last class, I didn't even catch that. Oh, yeah, whatever. I guess I can. Yeah. Alright. Um, anyway, that's the lesson. Smiley face. No, one more time. Ah, homework's not there. Oh, uh, bye.